invite you to open a Bible if you brought your own. If you don't, there's two Bibles you can use this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We've been going through a sermon series that has had the theme from Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians where he says, I want to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. Now, Paul obviously knew who Jesus was, believed in Jesus, believed in Easter and the Good for Paul, <laughs> right? Like, good job, Paul. I, I'm just, that's just not me. I'm not going to ever do that. But what I love is that Paul himself, in the midst of all that, like he's accomplished a lot in his ministry already, says, I still want to know, or I want to keep knowing, the power of the resurrection. And so we want that to be the theme of our lives because Easter is the whole point of Christianity. The whole point of believing in Jesus is his resurrection, that he has conquered sin, death, and the grave on your behalf to give you eternal life. And we want to be the kind of people that follow Jesus, not just on Easter, we go, well, that was wonderful, and then we never talk about it again or think about it again, but instead we want to, as Paul did say, in our daily lives, I want to continually know who Jesus is and the power of his resurrection. So these past few weeks, we've been looking at what does that mean for how we live differently. Well, in Romans, the apostle Paul makes a wonderful promise to you. He says, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Now, just think about that for a moment, that the same power, the same spirit of God that was at work in performing the greatest miracle ever, Easter Sunday, Jesus rising from the dead to give us the gift of eternal life, Paul says, that dwells now in you. So no matter what you think of yourself, some of you maybe, I don't know, are more arrogant than other people. You think of yourself as being really awesome. You know, I'm not going to point names out or anything, right? And then other times we look at ourselves or we look at others and we compare and contrast ourselves and we think what? Less of ourselves. And a lot of times we do the same thing spiritually. We look at Paul, we're like, man, that's just a world-class Christian. I'll, I'll never be like that at all. And so we compare and contrast ourselves or, or maybe it's someone that you've known or, or someone else in history that you've read about and you go, oh, wow, like, I wish I could be like that, but it'll never happen because we compare and contrast ourselves spiritually. We think, I'll never be that valuable. I'll never be that worthwhile. I'll never be that good at following Jesus. And yet Paul writes to every single Christian that the same Holy Spirit that was at work in him, that same Holy Spirit that used God's power to raise Christ from the dead dwells in you. So no matter what you think of yourself, you're like, I'm awesome. Or you think to yourself, I'm not that great. I, I'm filled with sin and all kinds of mistakes and shortcomings. The same Holy Spirit is at work and dwelling in you. And that's amazing good news for those of us who follow Jesus. That it doesn't matter our past or our, our struggles or our addictions or our ups and downs of life. No, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, that empowered Paul to do all kinds of amazing things in life, is at work in me. Like you have right now that same Holy Spirit, the same power of the resurrection dwelling and at work in you. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul's going to explain what does that look like within the church. And now, it's a really long chapter, and I'd love to go through the whole thing this morning with you, but some of you would get upset with me. So we're going to do a section of it, right? But the whole chapter is about spiritual gifts. It's about how the Holy Spirit calls us, sanctifies us, gifts us, and uses us to grow God's kingdom, right? To, to share the gospel and the love of Jesus, no matter who we are or what our gifts look like. And there's some important lessons. So this morning is going to be a little more like a Bible study. We'll kind of just go a, a few lines at a time and look at what Paul is saying for us. So he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. So that's an important first step for us to actually read God's word and be like, well, how does the Holy Spirit work in my life, right? To actually be aware of that of the good news that, that the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in who? 
Yeah, you can answer that one. Okay, I've said it about five times this morning. All right, it dwells in us. It's in you. It's in me, right? So Paul's first lesson is don't be uninformed. Read God's word and go, oh, that's the secret to his ministry. That, that's the, 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 the power behind what Paul was able to accomplish. That was the power behind any other Christian life that we look at as an example and say, oh, it was the Holy Spirit at work in them. And Paul saying, hey, I don't want you to be uninformed. God's word tells us that Holy Spirit is in you and at work in you. He says in verse two, you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, this, this statement, Jesus is Lord, is the early church's very first confession of faith, right? It, it was their very, very first creed. And so the summary of how do you know someone's a Christian is they would say, Jesus is Lord. He's God. He's Messiah. He's Savior. And what Paul's saying is nobody can do that. Nobody has that gift of faith. No one has that saving faith without the Holy Spirit. So why that is such good news for you and me is that when we are feeling worn out and beat up and like we're not doing the best we should be, we're not doing all that God has made us to be, or we're feeling uh, tempted to believe that we don't matter to the church or to God's kingdom, Paul's saying, well, if you believe in Jesus, if you're able to say Jesus is Lord, then guess what? You have the Holy Spirit. So no matter how your week is going, no matter how your day is going, no matter how you're feeling about yourself or your recent season of life, no, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. That's a guarantee. So it all depends on trusting in Jesus, not you being really awesome this past week. How many of you are really awesome this past week? Show of hands. A few of us. All right, good job. How many of you feel like, I got a B minus? It's like a little more fair. Great, okay. <laughs> I want you to understand, no matter how you're feeling about yourself, no matter what's going on, Paul is saying, if you believe in Jesus, if you say, Jesus is my Lord, you've got the same Holy Spirit in you that raised Christ from the dead. You don't have a lesser Holy Spirit. You don't have a smaller amount. You don't have a limited amount, because he's like, oh, we're just not gonna waste resources on you. No, you have the whole Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead at work in you, because you believe in Jesus. And for me, that, that personally is such encouraging and comforting news that's like, okay, good. So when I'm a complete disaster and mess everything up and don't do what Jesus has told me to do, no, the Holy Spirit still has use for me and is still at work in me. So whether you had a great week or a bad week, you have the Holy Spirit. Now in verse 4, he says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And this is one of the biggest themes of this whole chapter is verse 4. He says, there's a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. So how many gifts are there? Like lots of variety. Like, like Paul's just like, it's a variety, it's a big number, I'm not good at math, whatever. How many Holy Spirit is there? One, right? It's the same Spirit at work in who? Everybody. Okay, so good. We're paying attention. Right? We're being informed by God. Now, here's why this is so important. One of the things that we are so amazingly good at as human beings, even though it's terrible for us, is coveting, envy, jealousy, or if you want to call it another word, compare and contrasting ourselves to others. How many of you did that this past week, at least on this, just once? Anybody? Okay, good. A few of us were like, yeah, I'm not going to raise my hand, but I did it. Now, here's what we do. We do that in all kinds of aspects of our lives, even though it's terrible for us. One of my favorite Proverbs says, uh, a heart at peace gives life, but envy rots the bones. Right? It, it'll keep you up at night. It'll steal your joy. It'll sap your energy. So we know it's terrible for us, but here's the problem is that we don't just do it out in our regular lives. We also do it in the church. We compare and contrast how this person's doing versus how this person's doing. Peter did it with John. Jesus is like, Peter, I forgive you. I love you. Even though you denied me, I'm going to change your whole life. Peter's like, that's great. What about John? 
<laughs> right? It's like, that's a wonderful response to God's wonderful calling and promise for your life is to look at someone else and go, yeah, well, what about them? What are you doing for them? What kind of promise or gifts did you give to them? But what happens is we either fall into massive despair and take ourselves off of the team. Say, I'm no good anymore because I don't have that gift. I'm not talented that way. God isn't using me in that way. I'm jealous. I'm envious. And so we, we fall into despair because we're like, oh, what, what good am I? I can't do that. What about them? Or we become the most annoying type of Christian on the planet, which is the arrogant Christian. Because we get filled up with pride that says, how much better am I than you? Because I can do this. Even though Paul says, it's not you doing it. Who is doing it? The Holy Spirit. You're, you're bragging about you being useless anyway. So I, I don't know why we do that, but we do it, right? Anybody ever experienced this in life, in church? Sometimes we do it. I, I get this comment quite often throughout my time as a pastor. And I always try to recorrect you when you do it to me. So if you bring it up this week, I'm going to yell at you because you didn't listen to the sermon, okay? But I'll be gentle about it. It'll be a gentle, kind yelling, okay? But here's what people do. They come up and they go, you know, pastor, I can't do what you do. All righty. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. I don't, what do you want me to do with that, y'all? All right, like people come up, what they mean is I can't preach like you or I can't teach like you. Okay, well, like, so what? Like it's not a contest, but here's what happens. We have been so ingrained, especially in our tradition, that preaching and teaching has been elevated to be like the highest gift. When the Bible never says that. The Bible says, oh, there's a variety of gifts. And Paul's going to say even more about it. So here's my response, and it always weirds people out. So I'm just preparing you now, okay, if you do this to me. My response is always, that's really good. Why? Because there's a variety of gifts. And Paul's whole argument later on in chapter 12 is, and we need all of them. Right? If everybody showed up trying to do this, we would be the most annoying church in the history of churches, right? Like if we all just lined up here and said, it's my turn now, we'd be like, when can I go home? Be honest. Like, how many of you would just want to, like, yes, I want to get up here and hear between 60 and 100 sermons every Sunday? No more music, because if you're like me, that ain't going to sound good, all right? So we're, does that make sense? Like, it sounds ridiculous, but I'm trying to make it sound ridiculous so we realize what Paul is saying. And though there's actually a variety of gifts, and that's a good thing. It is good that we are all uniquely gifted and called, not just in our own imagination, our own desires, but by the Holy Spirit at work in us. In verse 5, Paul goes on, he says, And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all and everyone. So what is Paul saying? There's a variety of gifts, but it's the same Holy Spirit at work. There's a variety of ways to serve your, and love your neighbor and to love people. But it's the same God over us, right? And then he says, there's... Variety of activity. So there's a lot of options. There's a lot of ways for us to be the church, to share God's love with the world, and to see people have their lives and their eternities changed by the gospel. And at each time, though, Paul says what? There's only one spirit. There's only one Lord. There's only one God at work over all of it. And this is going to be hugely important for us to hold on to. And in verse 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for what? The common good. So stop bragging <laughs> about what God has gifted you to do, is what Paul's saying. Because one of the issues that the Corinthians had is uh, they had a huge issue of arrogance of, and comparing and contrasting 
whose spiritual gifts were better, which 2,000 years later, we still haven't learned anything yet because we're doing the same thing in our lives. But Paul's saying, here's the purpose for your gifting. It's not for people to praise you. It's not to get recognition. It's not to be like, whoa, look at this wonderful human being. Now, there's nothing wrong with thanking each other and encouraging each other. Actually, in fact, one of the spiritual gifts later that Paul will list off is, is the gift of encouragement. Right? What he's saying is, no, you've been gifted this way for what? The common good. So here's why this is so important for you and I to understand. Your spiritual gift that the Holy Spirit has given to you, so to each is given. So if you were able to say, Jesus is Lord, you have what? What do you call it? The Holy Spirit. And what does the Holy Spirit do here in verse 8? To each one is given. Right? To each one of us individually, we are given a portion of the Holy Spirit. We are gifted by the Holy Spirit for the common good. So here's why that matters so much. You, as a Christian, are a necessary part of the church. You are a necessary part of God's work of the Great Commission in the world. You are not optional. Your gifts are not optional. Because the Holy Spirit gave them to you for a purpose, and God's word says that purpose is the common good of the church and the world. And I want this mindset to, to change for us. Because so often we sideline ourselves and say, well, my gift's just not that important. It's not really needed. It's not that big of a deal. It's not gonna make that big, a, no one's gonna notice whatever else you come up with. But what Paul is saying is, no, actually, it's necessary. And it is needed for the common good of the church, the common good of the world, so that the Great Commission can be continued to be fulfilled and more and more people come to faith in Jesus. So whatever gifting the Spirit has given to you, we need it. <laughs> That's, that's the big idea of this morning. We, we need it. It's necessary for the church. And instead of it comparing and contrasting and saying one is better than the other, what we ought to do collectively as a church is just celebrate and rejoice whenever we see the Holy Spirit at work in someone's life and go, praise God that you have that ability, that you have that desire, that you have that gifting, because it's going to be a blessing to us, and together we're going to bless the world. So verse 8, he goes on, For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. And if you keep reading chapter 12, you get an even longer list of all kinds of gifts. The one I'll focus on right now is verse 11. Because I think this is not the first time you've ever seen a sermon or a Bible class on spiritual gifts, right? Like you've been going to church for a while, you're like, yes, we've, we've taken the surveys. Okay, great. The problem is no one ever talks about verse 11. And my opinion is it's the, it's the most important verse in the chapter. It says all of these all of these gifts, whatever which one you have, whichever one God has given to you and is using in you and is calling you to use for the common good of the church and the world, it says all these are empowered by one and the same spirit. Again, if you believe in Jesus, you have the whole Holy Spirit at work in you. The whole power of God that raised Jesus from the dead, that spirit is at work and dwelling in you. Not part of it, not a little bit because you don't think you're of yourself that highly, right? You're like, oh, some people get like 98% of the Holy Spirit. Hey, you know, I'm 2%, right? Some of you feel like 
I'm, I'm skim milk, 0%. There's nothing left. But here's the reality. Paul's saying, no, it's the one and the same spirit at work in everybody. Not a different one, not a lesser one, not a portion or percentage, but this one and the same. And then here's a hugely important part for us to take hold of. Who apportions or who gives out, whatever translation you have, to each one individually as he wills. So who, who's in charge of giving out the spiritual gifts? You or God? Not, right? Who's deciding how each one of us is gifted? Us, ourselves, with tests and surveys, or the Holy Spirit? Okay, now here's why that matters so much. Your gift matters then. Your talents, your passions, your desires have eternal significance then. Because if it's just up to us, by the way, as a pastor going through undergrad, pre-sem classes, going through seminary, and then continuing ed things for pastoral leadership and those kinds of things, I have taken every single version of a spiritual gift inventory that you could possibly come up with. You can't invent a new one for me because I've taken them all. They all end up being the same. And by the way, after you take them a while, this is what I did because... I'm not always a good person. I'm going to just get that off my chest, okay? I figured out how to manipulate these things because the answers all end up kind of being the same. You're like, what do I want to be on this one? And I would intentionally change my answers. Be like, oh, look, and people are like, oh, that's so cool that you're there. I'm like, I'm not that. What are you talking about, right? It's because I just got tired. To... Anyway, that's my little rant. Here's why it matters. Those surveys and tests, sometimes they can be helpful. But sometimes we, we can manipulate them out of jealousy, right? Out of envy. Oh, maybe God has gifted you in a way. And you're like, but I don't, what? like, you're like Peter. Well, what about John? What about them? What about this? Look, guys, I joke all the time that I can't sing, that I'm totally toned. It's not a joke. It's like I've had people in churches next to me going, could you please stop singing? Because it's throwing me off. I'm like, yeah, like, oh, and I'm like, that's fine. I'll praise the Lord in my heart, okay? Anyway, Psalm 150 says make a joyful noise. It didn't say make a good sounding noise. It just says joy, okay? So anyway, if you're like me, just let it out, guys. Anyway, fun fact, my brother has almost perfect pitch. <laughs> Ain't that something? <laughs> and here's why I bring this up. I would love to have the gift of actually being able to hold a pitch and sing. Now, that doesn't mean you come up to me afterwards and say, hey, pastor, we'll give you some lessons. I don't want the lessons. Like, I've accepted who I am in Christ, okay? <clears throat> in heaven, it would be totally different, and that's great. But I, I would love to have that gift, right? But I don't. And it's okay. I have other gifts. So what happens is sometimes we go, oh, well, what about them? What about her? What about him? What about that? And here's what happens. And later on in chapter 12, Paul even tells us not to do this, which is don't reject the Holy Spirit's gifts in your life. Because who decided you to be that way? Who decided to gift you in that way? Each one individually as he wills. So here, here's why this is so amazing. God looked at you and empowered you and then gifted you in certain ways and said, I'm doing this on purpose because the church and the world needs you to be that way. It's not an accident. God didn't mess up. It is not a mistake. He didn't go, oh, no. Well, they're already out, so here you go. Good luck. Now he looked at you and said, no, I'm doing this on purpose in your life because the church and the world needs that gift out of you. It's not optional, it's not wasted, and neither are you. You are absolutely needed and necessary for the good of the church and the good of the world. And this is what Paul's saying, He's like, look, well, there's a variety of gifts, they're all gonna look differently. And Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, didn't make a mistake when he chose to gift you that way. He did it on purpose because he said, oh, my church, my world needs you to be you. 
And this is hugely important for us as a church and as individuals. Because then we can stop wasting time of like, what about them? What about him? What about her? I can't do this. Can't do this. And instead, we can say, oh, okay, now I can participate in the Great Commission. I'm going to do it in my way, in my gifts. But now I can walk in the power of the Holy Spirit going, I, I know that I'm needed and I'm necessary and that God chose on purpose to make and gift me through the Holy Spirit in this way. So that's my plea for you is that you would trust this word of God that says, no, he, he did that to you on purpose. <laughs> now you might disagree, but like, oh, I could really love to hold a tune and sing something. But instead of rejecting it, resenting it, that you would embrace it and go, oh, okay. The Holy Spirit did this on purpose so that I could help with the common good of the church and the world by loving and serving people in the way that he has gifted me so more people can hear about Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for all the gifts that you have given to us. That no matter what our ups and downs are, whatever our struggles or our sins are, that the same Holy Spirit that raised you from the dead is at work in us, giving us saving faith and trust in you, is empowering us so that we can be part of your work here on earth, serving the church and the world to your glory. In your name we pray. Amen.